Good evening all, and welcome. Tonight, I have the pleasure of being joined by the incredible narrator, Darkness Tales. So get ready, because it's time to get comfortable, and let the darkness take control. I'd already found the engagement ring that my boyfriend Niles had hid in his sock drawer. Now, he was taking me on a romantic weekend getaway with a private dinner at the base of a waterfall. It was supposed to be the best day of my life, but now he's dead, and it's all my fault. I was ready to say yes. It's all I could think about on the drive through the state park. My family never thought it would last, but I was going to prove them wrong. Dad called Niles a pretty boy, and every time he saw a Disney princess, he'd point and ask, Hey, isn't that your boyfriend? I'd just smile and roll my eyes. They thought that just because Niles was handsome, that I was being superficial for being with him. But he was so much more than that. He was kind and smart and funny. And even more importantly, he made me feel like that's exactly what I deserved. Everything was so perfect that night, except me. Something by the Beatles was playing on a handheld radio and a dozen candles were scattered on the ground around us. There was chilled champagne in the ice chest, and stars in the sky, and the love of my life getting out of his chair to drop to one knee. Um, probably wasn't the answer he was expecting. It wasn't what I was expecting to say either, but it was the best I could do. Um... He asked in disbelief. I didn't drive all the way out here for an um. I was frozen. I'd rehearsed this moment a thousand times in my head, but my rehearsals hadn't prepared me for the breathless terror of the actual moment. All I could think about were my dad's words, wondering if it really was just his looks that I was attracted to. In ten years, when he started to bald and put on weight, Am I still going to think his jokes are funny? When we settle down and have kids, and romantic moments like these are replaced by daily chores and routines, will I still look at him the same way? Or even more likely, what if he's the one who gets bored of me? Um, I said again. Unbelievable, he said. What, I didn't say no. You didn't have to. He wasn't kneeling anymore. He wasn't even facing me, just staring off into the emptiness of night. It's a serious question. I could have said yes then, but I felt obliged to defend myself. There's nothing wrong with taking a moment to think. Take all the time you need. I'm going for a walk. Again, I had a chance. I could rush up to him and hug him and say, of course I wanted to spend my life with you but it only took him a few steps to exit the meagre light of the candles, and Niles was gone before I could gather my wits. The radio finished playing, and I was able to distinguish a strange plopping sound separate from the crash of the waterfall. My rapid breathing became louder, but it didn't drown out the mumbling whispers from the dark water. Niles, are you still there? The whispering grew louder, a low rasping voice that sounded nothing like Niles, just coming beyond the ring of light. I couldn't make out every word, but a few were unmistakable. Your doubt, your fear, delicious. That last word sounded with particular clarity, drawn out and savoured, as though each syllable was tasted. Niles was playing a trick to get back at me. That meant he couldn't have taken my hesitation too seriously. 
I breathed a deep sigh of relief, but didn't even have a chance to fully exhale before I heard the crack of twigs, then a muffled swear, all the way up the hill we'd hiked on. Niles? Was that you? My own voice so feeble and insignificant in the looming wilds. Come back, let's talk. All right, I'm coming. That was from the hill again. So he hadn't been the one whispering. I can tell you, hissed the whisper. A stir of movement behind me. I spun just in time to catch something like a long slug disappearing behind the light. How he feels, the whisper came from the same place. What he's really after, and whether you can give it to him. I heard Niles stumble, still a fair distance away. Okay, yeah, I said. I need to know. If a sound could curl like a smile, then that's exactly what the hiss did. Then it was gone, its barely perceptible shadow slipping into the darkness, deeper, beyond. Hold on, I'm almost there. Niles shouted from the same direction. Niles, watch out! It had only just occurred to me what I'd done. There's something out! His screams overwhelmed the splashing water and filled the sky from horizon to horizon. Torturous, guttural, and long enough that he had to pause to draw breath to begin screaming again. I was rushing towards him as fast as I could but I made slow progress as soon as I pitched into the blackness. I kept stumbling over hidden rocks, or blindly charging through thick underbrush, led by nothing but his screams which seemed to go on forever. But forever is a dream from which we are all forced to wake, and he was silent by the time I found him. This slug I glimpsed resting on his chest, pulsing as it burrowed his way into his flayed chest cavity. It was as wide as a tree trunk, maybe four feet long, perhaps more, depending on how deeply it moved with Niall's body. Do you still want to know? The whisper came from the free end of the slug. Everything he knew, everything he felt, his heart is not hidden from me. Would it be wrong to listen to this monster which feasted upon him? Or would it be disrespectful to turn away and forever lose his final thoughts? For the second time that night, I was frozen and said nothing. I can taste his admiration, mused the creature. From the first time he saw you, sitting alone reading a book. The intelligent focus on your face. The way the light played through your hair. He watched you for almost an hour before he worked up the courage to say hello. He never told me he was watching. I can taste his love, it hissed, fresh from his heart. It fills me, enough to endure a hundred years of adversity until the night at the end of all days when age has stolen everything but the grace of your spirit, he would have loved you. I had to hear this. Even though I was crying, I wouldn't leave. This was my solace and my punishment in one. The monster was silent a long moment before it said, I love you too. It was enough of a shock to suspend my heaving sobs. With everything he was, I am, it hissed. I love you with all his heart. The creature pulsed, then again, the ripple cascading up and down its fleshy mass as if it wriggled free. Niall's heart was in full view, raw and wet, and still beating where it was clutched in the creature's mouth then swallowing. The heart vanished, still beating all the way down. 
I'm back, the second mouth said, speaking with Nar's voice as clear as the mounting air. Let's just start over, okay? Don't overthink. Don't make assumptions. Don't be afraid. Will you marry me? I started to cry again. Yes, Niles. It was always yes. I wasn't about to lose true love twice in one night. Besides, maybe my dad will finally shut up about me only loving him for his looks. I hate my job. I hate selling days of my life while barely earning enough to sustain it. I hate my boss who tells me I'm lucky to find stable work in such an uncertain world. I hate my friends who treat dreams like an unfortunate symptom of youth that needs to be outgrown. And most of all, I hate myself for not doing anything to change. I keep waking up at the same time every day to sit in traffic. I read the same lines on the same billboard with the same happy models leering down at me. I don't think I could go on if I thought this was all there was, but if I'm waiting, then I don't know what I'm waiting for. That's why I started listening to self-help tapes in the car. Motivational speakers would tell me about how I had the power to change my life, and for a few minutes at a time, I'd believe them. That obstacles, no matter how great, were only in my mind that anyone could be happy if they just willed it hard enough. And if I wasn't happy yet, then I just had to buy another book and keep trying. My favorite speaker was a guy named John Fallow who claims he used to be a day laborer making less than minimum wage. When there weren't any jobs available, his fellow workers would play cards or chat, but he kept going door to door, knocking on businesses until he found one that needed work done. Pretty soon, John had enough clients and extra money that he started hiring the other laborers to work for him instead. The more jobs he got, the more workers he hired, until lo and behold, he was running a business of his own. Then they had a second location, and a third, and before you know it, he was a millionaire with 500 stores across the country. But it was never about the money, says the guy selling $30 audiobooks. He gave it all up so he could give motivational speeches and help others achieve their dreams. And sure, it was a lot of hard work and took many, many years, but he was the man he wanted to be, doing the things he loved to do, And that's all that mattered in the world. Of course, hard work isn't the only way to solve your problems, John said on one of his tapes. In fact, there's a lot of you who are probably getting discouraged right now because you were hoping for a shortcut. Well, I've got news for you, because there's a solution as easy as apple pie. You go on now, and kill yourself tonight. I couldn't believe what I heard. Had I heard that right? I had to rewind, but but there it was. Are you too fat? Well, diet and exercise is a lot of work, but you could put a gun in your mouth and never eat again. Or maybe you're feeling down because your relationship didn't work the way you wanted. No problemo, just slip on that noose and suddenly your ex will be the one who hates herself, not you. John's warm, bubbling voice didn't miss a beat as he proceeded to list a number of foolproof ways to die. 100% satisfaction guaranteed. Now some of you are probably skeptical that this is the right choice for you, but don't you fret about it. I'll be hosting live demonstrations around the country, so check my website for details and come see me if suicide is right for you. Part incredulous, part morbid curiosity. I visited the website and found he was hosting an event in my city next week. Sure enough, His website had a video of him standing on a stage with a man who hung from the rafters by his neck. The crowd was cheering like wild as the dying man's body was racked with its final spasms. John Fallow lifted the dying man's hand to reveal it, giving a thumbs up, and the crowd cheered even harder as though their team had just scored the final goal. I bought a ticket and printed out the confirmation code. I don't know why I did it. But for the first time in a long time, I really felt like I had something to look forward to. John was a man's man, rugged and handsome as they come. He wore a cowboy hat pulled low over one eye, faded Levi's, and a button-up shirt the day of the event. 
He greeted everyone at the front door with a firm handshake and a beaming smile, laughing and carrying on with people he'd just met like they were his oldest friends. I expected there to be at least a little outrage, but everyone who showed up seemed legitimately happy to be there. The feeling was contagious, and by the time I sat down with the rest of the audience, I already knew several people by name. Silly old me. I forgot what speech you all came to hear, John Fallow announced from the stage. Was it the one about working hard from morning till night, day in and day out? No. Chorused a hundred voices around me. I was half surprised to recognize my own as one of them. How about the speech about it being your fault if you aren't happy because you ain't trying hard enough? No. So you're telling me all you fine folks showed up just to hear how to fix all your problems at once in less than five minutes. That's what you want to hear. The enthusiasm was deafening. John Fallow mind whipping out a pair of pistols from an imaginary belt and rattled off shots into the audience. Everyone remotely close to the line of fire made a dramatic show of taking the bullet and collapsing back with great big grins on their faces. Then cheers again, an ocean of sound beating against my eardrums. Well, let's get started then, John roared. How about a volunteer? Come on now, don't be shy. There ain't nobody going to look down on you where you're going. A sea of hands like a flock of birds all taking flight at once. John stepped down from the stage and took the open hand of a middle-aged woman to help her into the spotlight. He led her to a stool where she sat down. What's your name, gorgeous? He asked. The woman swooned and mumbled something I couldn't hear. Caitlin, is that right? John said in his booming voice. Tell me, Caitlin, what's wrong with your life? Loud and clear, come on now. I was supposed to get promoted this year, she said, her voice trembling but audible. They gave the job to some young slut instead. Well, you aren't getting any younger, sweetheart. It's only going to get worse from here. She nodded and smiled as though that's exactly what she wanted to hear. I got just the thing for you, though, John said. A little medicine for what ails you. He produced a pill from a small leather bag in his pocket and offered it to her. She snatched it gratefully and clutched it in both hands. That's going to take the sting right out. Go on now. One quick swallow. Cyanide tastes just awful if you let it dissolve in your mouth. I watched with horrified fascination as Caitlin tossed the pill back and washed it down with a water bottle that John offered her. She gave a feeble smile as her face flushed bright red. The room watched in anxious silence as she started panting for breath. Each labored heave more desperate than the last. Almost there, hun, John whispered, his microphone washing the sound over the audience. Let's see those bastards at work take this one away from you. Caitlin fell off her stool and began rolling on the ground. The audience began to whoop and whistle. Within seconds, Caitlin lay still. Two men wearing staff shirts hustled out to drag her off stage. There was a brief silence when she stopped moving. I had the sense that everyone was trying to read the room, unsure of whether or not to scream and cheer. Then the applause began to ripple. Tentative at first, but growing by the second until the whole auditorium vibrated with its intensity. I felt sick. An anxious feeling flooded my body, but the cheering confused me and made me think that it was alright. If we were doing something wrong, then surely... Someone would have said something by now. Unable to shake the uncertainty, I left my chair and headed for the bathroom to clear my head. Outside the auditorium, I saw the two men wearing staff shirts exit a side door. The woman wasn't with them anymore. Was she still back there? Was she alive or dead? Maybe she needed help. One of the staff noticed me, his face screwing up with suspicion. I snatched a nearby trash bag and made to enter the door they just exited from. Hey, where do you think you're going? One asked. 
Bring in some more rope for John, I said, hefting the trash bag. Backstage is that way, right? The staff nodded and I slipped inside. I could hear the audience cheering again through the wall and felt the urge to cheer with them, but I thought better of it and stayed quiet. The hallway skirted the perimeter of the auditorium, and I was able to track my progress toward the back of the stage by the sounds coming through the wall. Another uproar. Perhaps a second demonstration has concluded. Another body to be dragged off stage. Not, not just a body. A human being. A father, or a mother, a son, or a daughter. That, that should have horrified me, but it, it, it didn't. They didn't ask to be alive. They didn't make the world the way it was, so why shouldn't they leave when they're ready? Looks like we got a bleeder here. John's voice carried. That's it, boy. Let it all out. You're the lucky one. The rest of us have to clean up that mess. I must have been directly behind the stage at that point. The place was dark and cluttered with electrical and sound equipment. I saw no sign of the woman's body. The thought of stumbling across her splayed out on the ground nauseated me. I shouldn't be here. A shaft of light tore through the room as the stage curtain was pulled aside. The staff were dragging a college-aged boy by the hands. His throat was cleanly slit, and a sheet of blood soaked through his shirt and drained onto the floor. I hid behind an upright speaker and watched the staff prop the boy up against the wall before turning to the exit again. Let's all take a break while they get this cleaned up, John said from the stage. Fifteen minutes? Then you'll all get your chance. The boy was still alive, spitting in gurgling blood. He panted with feeble wet gasps. His red smeared teeth were locked in a vicious grin. I started to creep toward him, but another blast of light made me scramble back to concealment. John Fallow moved through the shadows to stand over the dying boy. The boy's grin twisted into one of agony. He struggled to stand, but John put a boot on his chest and forced him back down. Shh, shh. He held a finger to his lips. Don't fuss. A lot of folks are dying to be with you. He laughed at his private joke. The boy tried to answer, but the wet sucking sound which escaped his lips carried no words. You did this to yourself. You wanted to fit in so damn bad that you didn't care what you had to do. Now look at you. It was too late to save him. The boy was barely breathing now and the pool of blood encompassing him was still growing by the second. John dropped to his knees to bring their faces level. It don't matter what other people expect from you, he said. The government wants you to make a lot of money to pay taxes. A holy man might tell you not to make any because it corrupts you. The people who sell burgers want you to be fat, and the people who sell diet pills want you to hate yourself for it. They all want something different from you. But you don't belong to them. You belong to you. The boy had stopped moving. I couldn't make out the faintest sign that he still drew breath. So what if you flunked out of school? Does that make the stars any less bright or the taste of strawberries more sour? Will you no longer feel your lover's caress or the ocean lapping your bare feet? Fear, pain, doubt, they're just passing clouds. And floating in front of the sun don't mean the sun ain't still there. So I'm gonna give you another chance, John continued. You get back up and go outside and tell me what you see. And if it's nothing but clouds, then pick one and call it beautiful and love it forever. Because it's all part of the same sky. With that, John Fallow pulled out a syringe and stuck it in the boy's chest. He began to buckle and squirm, but John held him down while wiping the blood from his neck with a handkerchief. It came off like makeup, leaving clean, fresh skin below. Get out of here, John said. And don't let me catch you back, either. The boy scrambled to the door and disappeared. You too, 
John said, looking to where I hid. Where it won't just be blood capsules and a temporary paralytic for you. I ran for it. Outside, I saw the boy with his head thrown back, looking straight up. Beside him was the woman who'd taken the fake cyanide pill, head back, and staring with wild eyes. I don't know whether they thought they'd really died and came back or whether they knew it was a trick, but one thing I'm pretty sure is that neither of them had ever looked at the sky like that before. I know that I hadn't. Patient name, Jordan Malone. Age, 42. Sex, male. Diagnosis, xenophobia. Time of death, to be determined. This report documents the performance of MJ220717 in the Skinner Prison Experiments. Due to the overcrowding of Varrock State Penitentiary, we have been provided with an operational license to transfer qualified subjects to our rehabilitation facility. MJ220717 was selected based on the following interview that our agent recorded in his blue notebook. Agent, please state the reason for your incarceration. MJ, Abina was threatening me, so I set his house on fire. You guys gonna get me out or what? The police statement says that you are armed and accompanied by three accomplices. The victim was unarmed, living with his wife and five children. How was he threatening you? Five children? Damn. You were unaware? I knew there were too many of them, but I didn't know they bred like roaches. They're threatening our way of life, and will flood the country if someone doesn't burn them out. Do you plan to burn out all 11 million illegal immigrants estimated living within the country? We killed 6 million Jews last time. Yeah, I reckon we can do 11, if we work together. So, you and your hate group. Hate group? We don't hate anybody. My mama didn't raise me like that. Let me ask you something though. You go to church? That's not relevant, cause I do. Me and Stan were doing God's work, doing the law's work, that the people are too chicken to do. Now I'm in jail while those guys walk around free in my country. So yeah, maybe I do hate that. That's injustice, pure and simple. I understand. Thank you, Mr. Malone. I think we can help each other here. MJ220717 was transferred to our facility two days later. He was happy to be released and provided no resistance as he was introduced into his new living quarters. He was provided with a standard suite, approximately 500 square feet with a private bathroom and mini kitchen. There were no all to them. I'm standing up to them. If a snake got in my house and I strangled it before it bit someone, that's bravery right there. I'm protecting my country. Are we finished? You said we could help each other. And I got you out of prison, didn't I? Now, it's your turn to help me with my study. Unless you'd prefer to go back, of course. Let's get this over with. What I have to do? Talk to a counsellor? Something like that. We're pursuing a form of exposure therapy. It's only going to take two hours a day. The rest of the time will be yours. With access to television and recreational facilities. I've heard of this exposure thing. So what are you going to do? You're gonna lock me up with a spick? We're gonna play checkers or some stuff? This isn't about your relationship with foreigners. We're more interested in the deeper, underlying issues, your fear of the unknown. MJ220717 did not protest as he was locked inside his living quarters. Security footage continued to monitor him as he paced the room in agitation. This continued for several minutes before he returns to his bed and points the remote at the TV. The screen remains blank. He points again, 
mashing the buttons in visible frustration. He gets off the bed and approaches the TV, reaching to turn it on manually. He isn't expecting the hand which reaches out of the screen to intertwine its fingers with his own. He stumbles backwards and falls onto his bed. The hand is gone by the time he returns to the screen and smashes it with his fist. MJ-220717 hyperventilates as he removes the shards of glass from his knuckles, but he otherwise seems unaware of the entity now sharing his living space. All agents have vacated the area to give it space to work. MJ-220717 goes to the bathroom, presumably to look for medical supplies. He isn't expecting the swarm of spiders that flood from the medicine cabinet. The capacity is only a few cubic feet, but the contents are sufficient to cover the entire surface area of the bathroom within seconds. MJ-220717 flees the bathroom and closes the door behind him. He presses his back against it for several seconds, his hyperventilation exasperated. When he notices the spiders crawling under the door, he retreats to the bed and pulls the sheets to block the space. He's hampering on the apartment door, calling for help. There is still an hour and 40 minutes left on his session, and the door remains locked. The entity does not remain idle during this time. The hand has reappeared out of the garbage disposal, feeling its way around the kitchen sink. MJ-220717 notices it now. He approaches and stares at the thing, realising that it's growing into the room rather than reaching similar to the development of a time-lapsed plant or mushroom. The hand and arm are swelling, the joints growing more gnarled and misshapen, and additional fingers begin to bud. MJ-220717 tries to turn on the garbage disposal, but the hand intercepts him and interlocks its fingers once more. They struggle briefly, before the subject is able to manoeuvre his free hand to reach the switch. He turns it on, but the intertwined hands drags him into the blades. He manages to turn off the garbage disposal before his hand enters. He flees once more to the front door, pounding and screaming. The bathroom door opens. The spiders have been growing in the same manner as the hand, and each one and now the size of a rat. They're now large enough for him to realise that they are scuttling on tiny fingers instead of legs. MJ220717 spends the remainder of his two hour session pressed against the door while the growing entities crawl all over him. He's still crying when the agent retrieves him and permits him to move to a fresh living space. Ever seen anything like that? MJ-220717 is crying quietly. We're not so different, you and me. Or you and those people whose house you tried to burn down. Or you and your ancestors 10,000 years ago. We're all pretty much the same, compared with something like that, don't you think? I want to go back to jail. Please. You have 22 hours before your next session. Feel free to take comfort with your fellow humans in the recreational area until then. You have more in common than you think. I was almost friends with a monster when I was 11 years old. I would have preferred a human friend, but my family had just moved to a new city where everyone was cold and distant. My father promised that I would meet new people at school, but there were still a few weeks of summer and I had nothing to do. Elisa Williams was the one I really wanted to be friends with. She lived next door in a beautiful gray house with a high fenced yard. I used to sit with my back to the fence and listen to her playing and giggling, the sound bubbling up like music made for everyone, everyone but me. 
I wasn't brave enough to introduce myself, but after a few days of moping around the house, my mother volunteered to do it for me. I stood behind her, carrying a basket of cookies while she knocked on the neighbor's door. Lisa! The man who opened it looked like a poorly shaved bear. Get over here and meet your new friend. We're busy, came the shrill response from somewhere deeper in the house. My mother marveled about the woodworking and craftsmanship and asked the age of the venerable structure. Now, Elisa, the bear bellowed, I know you're alone up there. A short, angry sigh, like what circus lions must do before they're forced onto the stage. Then footsteps creaking down the stairs. I've got cookies, I supplied hopefully. Elisa spends all day playing by herself, the bear said. She's been so lonely since her mother passed. Some company will be good for her. I thought about the giggling I heard through the fence, and I didn't understand how someone could have such a good time on their own. Elisa appeared a moment later, her head hanging low in surly obedience. She wore shorts and long socks pulled halfway up her thighs, one bright green and the other purple. That's all I really saw because I was so embarrassed that I couldn't look up from the basket of cookies I held out. Elisa snatched the whole basket and briskly turned around again. I glimpsed a wave of black hair, curly like her father's but not so wild. After a few steps, she turned to glare over her shoulder with an expression a vegan might give a barbecue. Well, are you coming or not? I hadn't taken my second step before she cut in. Shoes off. I hasted to obey. No, the socks can stay on. What are you, some kind of barbarian? Uh, no, ma'am. I don't know why I said that, but I was scared of her and I didn't want to give her any reason to send me away. Elisa seemed satisfied with that answer, though, and she permitted me to follow her up the stairs toward her room. I felt like I was on solid ground until she said, We don't need any more friends, and none of our games have room for a third person. Uh, your dad said, He isn't my dad. He killed my father and took me prisoner. Um, oh yes, she said, pivoting her socked heel on the wooden floor so smoothly that she seemed to almost float. But that's okay, because sometimes he brings me little boys to eat. I could only hope that my stunned silence was mistaken for composure. Elisa rolled her eyes and opened the door to her room. Just kidding. You're not stupid, are you? I didn't realize I was holding my breath until that moment. I'm sorry. That wasn't a fair question. Most stupid people don't know they're stupid, and I suppose it's perfectly fine if you are, as long as you don't try to perform surgery or vote or do anything a normal person would do. Elisa rambled. The stairway and hall we passed were heavily decorated with framed portraits, hanging tapestries, and ornate tables littered with precious and intricate things. It was a stark contrast to Elisa's room which had a simple metal frame bed in the corner and dark wood cabinet on the other side. The walls were painted black, and the window was concealed beneath a thick curtain. There was nothing on the hardwood floor to disrupt the monastic austerity. How do you play games without any toys? I asked. We play blood games, she said, stressing the plural again. The kind that need magic to work. You do know about magic, don't you? Yeah, of course. I didn't want to say anything more to betray my ignorance. I reached for a cookie from the basket, but she slapped my hand away. I stood in disbelief as she ate one of the cookies herself. My mother taught me after she passed, Elisa said casually, moving to set the cookies on the cabinet. She retrieved something and turned to face me again. If you want to play, then you'll need to give me your hand. What do you mean after she passed? I tentatively stretched out to her. Now close your eyes. She could have told me to jump out the window and I probably would have done it. She had the sweetest smile on her face and the soft brush of her fingers tracing my palm made me blush. I closed my eyes and took a deep breath. Don't scream. Mother hates screamers. I opened my eyes a sliver, just in time to see a metallic flash in the air. 
Elise's grip tightened around my wrist while her free hand gouged a needle into the center of my palm. I didn't scream exactly, it was, it was more of a, a shrieking, yelping sound, uh, like a rabbit trying skydiving for the first time. I tore my hand away with the needle still in it, blood freely running between my fingers. Come back here, Elisa shouted. You're gonna make a mess. We both dashed for the door. I hesitated to avoid running into her, but she pushed me aside and didn't slow until she slammed it shut and locked it from the inside. You're wasting the blood. Give me your hand. No, you'll stab me again. I gingerly pulled the needle out of the skin, prompting a fresh swell of blood. I felt dizzy. Baby, she snorted. That hurts slightly more than the needle. You're already bleeding, so I don't need to stab you now, do I? Here, wipe some on me. She offered me the back of her hand. Bewildered, I rubbed a long smear on her pale skin. Her dark eyes sparkled as she watched with eager fascination. I almost took the opportunity to flee, but I couldn't resist asking, How does blood magic work? Mother said that when the world was young, all living things were connected, and the same blood flowed from one to the next. Elisa plucked the needle from my fingers and pricked her clean hand daintily to draw forth a single drop of blood. We started to fight one another, though, and it got worse and worse until we had to pull apart into separate entities. We became so distant that we started taking different shapes, and some animals even preyed upon others until we forgot that we were ever the same. The blood is the only part of us that never forgot. Using the nail of one index finger, she deftly traced a pattern in the blood, a circle with a triangle inside, and a square inside that, and perhaps even a tiny pentagon within. With deep concentration, she pressed the single drop of her blood into the center of design on my hand. Now what are you doing? I asked. She smiled, but the gesture seemed strained and unnatural, like a dog baring its teeth for dog food commercial. Duh, she said. I'm making magic. And she was. The pattern of blood on her hand was glowing, soft at first but growing brighter in even pulses. My heart began to race with excitement and the pulsing light increased to match its rhythm. What's it do? I asked. I'm going to grow you a friend, she said. That's what you want, isn't it? I wanted to tell her that I didn't need a friend anymore because I had her, but we don't always get what we want, even from ourselves. Well, especially from ourselves. Yeah, sure, that's what I came here for, I said. Okay, watch. The light grew stronger, but I couldn't look away. The pattern was moving now. The triangle was turning within the circle and the square within that, which moved in the opposite direction. And from the center grew a red stalk, like a time-lapsed beam struggling through her skin to sprout and curl into the air. Within a breathless moment, the stalk had grown over a foot. The veins of Elise's hand glowed beneath the skin like a network of roots, and from that strange plant, an even stranger fruit began to swell. What is his name? Elisa asked. Um, how about Sid? The fruit looked like an organ with a face. I didn't know what a fetus looked like at the time, but when I saw pictures when I was older... I knew that's what it was. How big will he be? Uh, I want to be taller than he is, I said. She smiled. What? I said. We'll be playing sports and stuff. I, I want to win. What does Sid like to eat? She asked. Uh, I glanced around the empty room, spotting the basket. Cookies, I guess. It was larger now. I can make out tiny blue hands and feet pressing against its transparent cocoon. And what does he love? Her voice was fainter now, straining with exertion. Her glowing veins extended all the way down her arm now, and for the first time I realized 
the concentration on her face was mixed with pain. I... I don't know, I... I don't think I like this game, I don't want to play anymore. You can't stop now. What does Sid love? Elisa took a sharp intake of breath and grimaced. The plant had stopped growing, and the swiftly gorging fruit was about the size of a watermelon. How was it getting so big? Or was it filling up with her blood? Stop it, I said. My voice cracked, but I didn't care. Make it go back. Cut it off. It's not an it, she grunted. His name is Sid, and he is already alive. You have to tell me what he loves, or he will be nothing but... I hate him. I hate him. Make him go away, please. Hurry. You're part of the spell, too. I can't do this alone, she said. It wasn't a watermelon anymore. It was the size of a dog beginning to grow coarse fur. Now it was heavy enough that Elisa had to kneel and rest it on the ground. The hands and feet were becoming more defined and solid by the second. My eyes fluttered once and then opened to pierce me with a pale, sightless orb. Mr. Williams! I screamed. Mr. Williams, help! It's hurting her! Thunder on the stairs, but the wretched thing reacted to the noise and flailed its arms. One wild claw pierced straight through its encompassing sack and clawed the open air an inch from my face. Bright red fingers clutched the tattered opening and ripped it wide with a rush of blood. All at once, Sid was free and on the ground, standing almost as tall as me, pounding on the door. It was still locked. What's going on in there, Elisa? Are you okay? She laid panting on the ground. The blood was beginning to evaporate into a thick red mist. I choked, fell to the ground to avoid breathing in the heavy, wet air. The tattered sack, the discarded dying stem, both withering before my eyes. Sid was crouched in terror, its matted blue fur showing through the evaporating blood. Open the door! Boy, are you in there? I crawled across the ground to unlock the door. More pounding. Louder and more desperate than ever. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw Sid flinching at each resounding crash. The instant I fully turned away from it to unlock the door, I heard Elisa scream. I pounded back the lock, and the enormous pressure on the other side made the door spring like a trap. The man was roaring, but it was too late. Elisa's stomach had been savagely opened. Sid loomed over her, digging through her stomach as though searching for something. When it turned to face Mr. Williams' onslaught, it was shoveling a bloody clump into its mouth. Mr. Williams almost caught it, but it bounded away just in time. The bear man moved to the window to block its retreat, but he missed again when Sid lunged for the basket on the cabinet instead. By the time the man caught up with it, Sid had already fled through the door. It's my fault. I heaved for air. Mr. Williams knelt above his daughter, clutching her soaked body to his chest. I, I, I could have shaped it, I said. I, I could have told it not to hurt anyone. I'm, I'm so sorry. We need to get out of the house, he said. I followed him downstairs, though I knew it wouldn't return. The monster had been born with but one desire, and it would stop at nothing to get it. There was nothing left to satisfy it here. A cookie monster was born that day. Well, hello everyone. My name is Darkness Tales. I really hope you enjoyed my narration tonight. If you did, make sure to hit the like button and click subscribe on this video. I'm sure the link to my channel will be in the description down below. I'm a creepypasta narrator as well as a horror film cinematographer. On most Fridays I try to set out videos where I can interact with my audience, as well as put out 4-5 to five videos a week. So I really hope you guys will come join me on over there, hit the subscribe button, and get ready for a journey into darkness. So with all that being said, I consider you all my darkness militia from here forth, and as always, have a terrifying evening.